Okay, Rohit, maybe uh, why don't we start off by uh, just sharing us where you are calling in from today, and then we'll jump into the meat potatoes of everything. Yes. Uh, hey, this is Rohit. I'm signing in from Bombay in India. It's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's about 1.30 in the morning today. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, Rohit, we're, uh, we're excited to get to dive into the conversation. I know we've chatted a few times before, but today we're going to dive into kind of anything and everything to do in this whole world of uh, exciting early stage startup investing. So perhaps you can give us a little bit of a background to start where you came from, all the great things that you've kind of been doing over the years, where you're at today, where you're looking to go in the future. I know that sounds like a lot. And then one thing about you that nobody will know. Oh, okay. Anyway, thanks, uh, thanks, JP, for having me here. I think we had some good conversations earlier, and I think this is a good uh, lead up to that. Uh, I'll give you a quick run through of where I've come from and what's next, etc. on that front. So from a point of view, uh, well, I, I call myself, I entered, I'm actually from the advertising segment. So I've been working in advertising. Uh, but again, I've never really worked in advertising before. So the, my first ever entrepreneurial venture was in advertising. So I've, I founded three different companies and my first ventures in advertising got in early in 2009 in the digital spectrum. Uh, this is when the the word digital was still unknown in this country. It was just kind of picking up. People were confused about what social led advertising was, et cetera. And that's where we came in. Um, so we were right place, right time. We scaled very fast. We grew to becoming um, one of the largest advertising agencies in the country. So this is the agency I co-founded with a friend of mine called Varun. It's called Glitch. Uh, so we scaled quite quickly. So as anything that scales, uh, at some point, the big guns came knocking. So we had about uh, a few people knocking at our door saying, hey, what, what's next in line for you guys? So when we had to look at it, we waited from that lens saying that scale versus control, what do we look at? So we decided that we want to scale further. So the best way to scale further was to align ourselves with a big network. And that's when WPP seemed like a great fit. WPP is one of the largest advertising networks in the world. So we jumped on ship with them. We got acquired by WPP in about two, around 2017. Uh, parallelly, while the glitch journey was on, I did start another company called um, Chatterbox. This is, I found this space that was booming called influencer, creator, etc. So we said, hey, can technology come and disrupt this? So that was another company that we started. That's, that's still running on its own. Uh, while I play a much smaller role there, more a strategic investor in Chatterbox, but that's largely where the journey has been. Now it's been, uh, uh, well, it's been about 11 years that I've spent in advertising. I've been working with multiple brands, helping brands scale, find their footprint, uh, both online, offline, etc. So I thought it's a good way to now adapt and go and see how, where else can I lend this to. So that's when I started working with a bunch of startups who were, who I was mentoring and advising on that front. And that space really excited me. So that's when I said, hey, while I'm mentoring and advising you, how about I come on board? Because I also had access to capital because of an acquisition, right? So, so okay, how about I start investing in them? That's that's really where my investment journey started. So where, if you ask me where I'm headed to now, I don't know. Uh, I'm still with Glitch. I do have a... Uh, a daily uh, job there with Glitch. I do actively invest. I end up meeting about 10 to 12 startups a month, chatting with them, try to see where synergies match, whether it sits in my thesis and sometimes I end up investing. What's next? I don't know. It could be another, a new venture on its own or do I get into capital? That's something I have I left it largely open for me to decide there. So yeah, that's a quick gist of my journey so far. I love it. And uh, one thing about you, nobody would know. Oh, well, that's... Uh, so I have... One thing that nobody knows is that I have never worked in advertising before. So when we started an agency, uh, both of us had never worked in advertising. So the good thing was that that really helped me. When we started advertising agency, we didn't because we didn't work in advertising, we didn't know the rules of advertising. 
so we'll wrote our own rules so similarly i think my next piece if i look at venture capital or if i look at investments i have never studied finance before or i've never studied venture before so it's i'm literally writing or learning the things on the go as i play around so yeah that's i like to take a jump into things which i have which are the unknown i love it so it gives you a good way to challenge yourself yeah absolutely so one of the things that i, I wanted to kind of go back to and and this is just based on the conversations and your background one of the things that i found um interesting about you jumping into a space that you've never been in built up a company sell the company to a lar- the largest uh, advertising platform so you're able to change the way people do things but inside of this there's also another element which is um part of marketing which is your kind of self marketing aspect and building a brand around yourself and what i really enjoyed and liked about the things that you've done in your past experience and i'm assuming you'll take this going forward was the things around um tedx top 40 under 40 uh, like all of these things that create impact around you which brings value back to your business so if we were to to go back and say you know is there something that really drove you to um was it because you were going into a new space or was it because what you were trying to show and prove was hey we're doing something different and i got to use these other vehicles as a way to market myself so that i'll stand out so that you'll believe me then what we're doing is great because it's kind of i wouldn't say it's abnormal but the great thing is is that you've built up this really great persona and that makes a big difference when you're trying to get investors to invest in you or with you So can you give us a little bit about that journey because I think that that makes a big difference for startups to be able to say I never thought I was worthy enough to get on a stage or I wasn't uh worthy enough to uh brand myself I didn't think I knew enough but you took that reins and went right at it and blasted it all over the place with great content which is a total marketer's dream so how did you kind of start that journey and what got you interested in doing that Well uh I think a large part of what we do in advertising is take brands and kind of literally brand and tell a story around it right so we take a brand tell a story and market it in a certain way now that same principle at some point has to apply to us as well saying and the good thing is today i wish hindsight was foresight as i say right because today i can turn around and say hey i've never worked in advertising before so it, when we started an agency we managed to rewrite the rules it could have gone south I could have gone in a different direction. I could have turned around and said, "I wish I had worked in advertising before for me to write the rules." So um, the thing is, you always play to your play the right strengths that you seem to have or the right USP that you have, and then brand and work things around it. And that's something that we've gone ahead and done. So the minute we saw success, we said, "Okay, how do we position ourselves differently from everybody else that exists in the market?" So if people are saying that, "Hey, listen, we are we are the largest conglomerate," we got 18 years of experience and 30 years of experience in say and that's how our company is able we don't run say no we we probably have no experience in building a company but we have experience in solving problems and we'll find the fastest easiest way to solve for whatever problem it is and that's the position that we took so it's it's largely what i do for brands and i think it's important to apply that to individuals to startups to investing companies etc to p- build a brand around yourself to have a thesis to have a a a, f- a thing that people will identify you with and then we can go from there so that's slash you it is so when you when you did this and you put together this branding around yourself did you find like going in and doing the impact 40 under 40 that it bring it brought you guys a lot of notoriety in a space or a business that you probably said to yourself when you started why are we doing this we're not marketers and then you were able to just turn this into a real uh successful uh, business so what made you think i need to do this was it a mentor like what got you to say i need to go and apply for these things i need to be part of them because i got to create an image around myself if i'm going to take this risk i better be the damn good at it and be the best at this risk 
actually uh, it's it's actually the other way around and i really wish i could turn around and say that hey this was this is the idea that we had and we wanted to position ourselves it's actually not that way so what has happened is for the long we've been really bad at talking about the kind of work we do or doing this we were so busy doing the work and this uh, somebody in the company once made this uh, statement saying that the shoemaker's son never has shoes right so it's literally that so it's we were too busy making shoes for everybody else so at some point we took a conscious call saying uh, we need to get a pr agency on board that will help you at least put out a point of view out there and that's so all i mean the the one that you're referring to the and the fact that you're on lists etc is something that they manage to send your profile across and then it's chosen by a set of people on that front so it's not an active effort from our end but we did make an active effort to bring in an agency a pr agency who was able to drive a narrative so we were able to sketch out a narrative and give it to them and they they kind of reached out to the touch touch points and put that out there awesome so how much you know how much value do you now look at a pr agency or the marketing side as you've been in this for so long how valuable this is to a startup business i i actually think it's extremely valuable um, so i i when i talk to a lot of these startups and I, when they talk about saying okay hey we we look we are now ready to get into that space i said first thing is that people need to know that you exist so then so before you go out and build a larger brand story and brand persona what is important is for somebody to discover you straight up so it's important for you to be seen in the right place right so sometimes and this is largely for a lot of consumer facing guys now it helps in different spectrum so one if you're going to be fundraising then if you're you will see that a lot of companies that come out suddenly bursting in the press it clearly means they're fundraising they're looking to raise funds so which is why they're putting their story out there uh two it is it's a great form of marketing to pull your product out right so talk talking primarily about your product say and pr for me right now is evolved it's no longer just a article in a newspaper magazine it could even just be an influencer talking about it right? so the minute people start talking of your product that's when somebody starts looking for this product they google you they find you and then you lead them to the destination say, telling them the whole story but it's important to uh, is pr important i think it's a very very uh, important part in the life cycle of marketing for a brand i would say uh, definitely in the early stages the more pr you use because it's far easier for people to discover you as part of something that they're reading consuming etc than for them to discover you otherwise so i would say pr is definitely a key part no that makes a lot of sense so how much of a budget marketing budget if you're an early stage company and you've got and i am all for this this is why we're talking about this stuff because i agree 1000% that when a startup becomes uh starts off i find that a lot of them go right away to i need to build i want to build this thing they haven't really verified that the problem exists they haven't gone out and got a client to support it they just feel that there's a need for this and they start building so i i assume and put this number about 95% of people are builders 5% of people are sellers and of the sellers there's some marketers in there of course that's part of selling but there's this 95% of builders and they don't always take on that idea that i should start testing build, um marketing pring i should do some stuff to validate myself first so taking what you've just shared and and what is a good percentage of that is there a percentage that you look at and say okay you know what if you're going to build some success you need to do a triple of um trickle effect start something small while you're building along get some ads do something that gets your brand out there a little bit so that as you build your product and build market fit your marketing's following along with that and you're pivoting and shifting all at the same time is there a percentage that you would recommend early stage pre seed seed rounds that you say you know what 5% always and then build on that like is there something you would recommend because i think there's a gap here yes i have i actually um i read this before i think it, it was a line from facebook but i stick by that it says ship at 30% because you will never be 100% satisfied with your product right so you you what you think is 100% in your head will keep changing 
uh, month on month because you'll keep getting feedback on different points. So unless you don't put it out there in the market, you don't know what's coming up, coming your way. Oh, if it's even worth building what you're building. So I've always said ship at thirty percent, at no matter what you're doing on that front. Uh, I, and it's, I mean, from a from a point of view, I say that when you ship at thirty, it also means that you put the right kind of ammunition behind that 30 and see what is being adopted from this so there are nine or ten times you will end up pivoting from what you were trying to build to what you are going to because uh, at 30 you realize what the actual use case for this is uh, or is there a use case at all i have seen this both with uh, i mean primarily with a lot of consumer facing startups which what we think is a great idea to solve for on paper the minute it goes there, that's not the idea to solve for. And suddenly people are looking for a different solution. And at 30, you'll realize this. But there's no point trying to aim to perfect your product and put it out because, I mean, it's it's about who gets to market first. It's not about who, not necessarily always about the best one in the room. So, Awesome. I, and I like that. 30% ship. I think we should put that on like a big flag so that everybody sees it because they're like 100%, 100%. And by the time they ship the product, they're broke. So now you, you've got this real concrete structure that says, you know what, you're going to lear, learn and work with your customers and you're going to ship at 30%. Now, how much of a budget would you allocate to supporting your, your, sh- your launch? Is that marketing budget? Do you put something there? I know people will always waste, wait until they get to their first raise of seed round or something before they put marketing dollars in. But do you recommend something else to get this brand story going? Because I know it's so important and people don't seem to think this. Yes, uh, I definitely think it's... So I think a brand needs to be built from day one. Um, so it's as important to your product as... And again, it depends on from companies to companies or depends from the category you're in. But if you're a consumer-facing company that you're trying to build, then end of the day, whatever you build is... It, there needs to be a brand story attached to it. And the earlier you do it, the better. Because what happens, and I've seen a lot of people do, is that they go ahead and they they try to put it out. And I've seen this with a few startups who don't don't put, um, these are more direct-to-consumer startups, right? So they don't invest in design. They don't invest in telling a brand story, et cetera, in the first half. So they put a great product out, but it's not packaged the right way. So they don't see the kind of sales they do. They, they necessarily need to see. What they're all waiting for is that, hey, we will hit a certain number, then we'll raise our Series A, and at Series A is when we can try to afford an agency. Now, and this is, a, this is also a large problem that exists in our in the advertising spectrum. Right? So we have been working very actively, and I wrote an article the other day calling something the creative capital, so which I call the alternate capital, right? saying, Agencies are also very nicely primed today to make that space into venture capital where they turn around and say, if I was to work with a young D2C brand who is making a great product, their expertise is probably not brand building. I will turn around and say, let me help you build a brand and take equity instead because they can't afford to give you money. But let's take equity. So which that then converts into a larger story. So we're both accountable on that front. So if you ask me right now, I would say that a brand needs to be built from day one. You need to have a vision or a story or a thing to say from day one. The amount of money you spend on it is not the uh, the actual aspect of it. It's more saying that, okay, hey, we've, we've managed to package it a certain way that people look at us in a premium light. So I know somebody who was building a uh, company where the product was excellent. It failed because people didn't want to pick it up the shelf because it, it wasn't attractive enough to pick it up. If you picked it up, you would have come back and bought many, many, you would have had enough repeats. But the, if you didn't get somebody to pick that up, then then there's a problem. And that picking up happens with branding. So, I love that. And, and branding does play in all of this, in all the things that you've done in the uh, 40 under 40, the TED Talks, it's all branding. And it really emphasizes <laughs> how you or your company can value from that. So there was one thing that, and, and I... I've mentioned this in talks that I've gone on and, and done before and, and still do. It's that there's 12 touch points before you close a customer. We don't realize what those touch points look like. 
They could be an email. They could be a message board. They could be a friend talking. They could be a TV screen. They could be a million things before a comfort level comes in to close people. So if branding is key to your business and you're allocating that little budget from the beginning, like you said, building that brand, that that touch point can come over one month or it can come over two years. So you really do need to focus in on starting early because you never know when that 10th or 12th conversion is going to happen to win that customer over. So if that means you got to try a lot of different things along the way, one of the things I like that, that you've done is that you've pushed into awards and things like that, that you guys have benefited from uh, on the um, great content you put together are the things that you suggest that are a ways to get other people to support your brand and do awards work? Do that type of thing really support an early stage company, like getting in every pitch event, um, working awards in a sector because you're in manufacturing and sciences, go to a university and win an award. Like, do you feel that all of these things really support and help that startup get those touch points? So I'm not sure if awards will, uh, so what you talk of touch points technically is what we call a consumer journey, right? Yeah. So, and if, if from the moment I see a product to the moment I click buy or pay for it, there are multiple places where you can come and talk to me at, and that's what you mean by touch points. Now, when I draw this out, awards for me is the early stage part of it, which is if you're the most awarded product there suddenly, and then yes, you have my attention. Now that that's only one small part of it. I don't know if an early stage company awards matter as much. It's probably going to be uh, much unless you ba- built a product that's just like it's game changing on that front, right? So, it, uh, so when when I open the Apple App Store and it tells me the most awarded game this year is so and so, I, I mean, it's not a genre I play, but because it said it's the most awarded game. I will download it just to give it one shot at. So you, yes, uh, is awards a touch point? Yes, it's a, it's some form of a recognition or it's validation, right? So, and consumers are looking for some form of validation there. So it is, but for an early stage company, I don't think awards are going to be their key aspect because I get, even to get to that award, they have to be about a year in the system. They have to be running, they have to have sold an X amount of product. So I don't think an award is the, aspect but there are multiple such touch points that come in from um i mean and which for me largely it's it is a lot of word of mouth that will be built it in it's people who who you trust which again which brings you back to that whole influencer conversation i'm having right so it's people you trust in that in that trust pyramid um the problem that it, the legacy brands have is that in the pyramid of influencers they go and touch the top the top 1%, which is the celebrities, et cetera, who nine out of 10 times are not using your product. The, the, the ones who actually convert for you are the mid segment. So getting the right people in to talk about it, who whose trust value on, on that category is high enough is one way to get your product out there. So I would, I mean, when I speak to founders, I keep telling them your aim shouldn't be to bring Tom Cruise to use this uh, headphone that you've got. It's it's probably the guy in my class or my office who who is an audio who will turn around and tell me that hey, listen, this is the best one to wear, and I'll trust him more than I do. So try working towards that because everybody gets swayed by the glamour of advertising, which is that top one percent. But the 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 actual effectiveness is much slower than that. Oh, that's some great advice. And uh, yeah, you got to kind of start somewhere and going all the way to the top might not be the best usage of your dollars. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because a startup was telling me that the other day. We're just like, we need to figure out how to get LeBron James to use this. I'm like, eh, I'm not sure that's really where you want to go. It might cost you a lot to get that high, but maybe there's somebody a little lower. Yeah. So you've kind of put together this um, a little a, a clean approach for the startup to kind of move forward. So and all these little touch points make a difference in the long run. And you're starting these touch points at the beginning. So now kind of fast forward your business, you've got market fit, you're growing. What kind of things do you see that will really help an investor have more interest in that startup? So now you might be at that seed level, or maybe you're, you've just raised your pre-seed. 
What kind of things do you think investors are attracted to? Because you mentioned it before, it's about de-risking. It's about finding uh, ways to, well, convert somebody. So what other things would interest you in investing in that company? They've built a brand. They've got some great things going. What kind of, what other things do you want to see that come out of this? So I, because I'm more of an angel investor or an early stage investor, right? So I come into companies at a much, much early stage, which is probably that they're, they're kind of trying to find their product market fit. And my advice to all of them is that that's great. You will find, we can work together. We'll identify the space that you need to be in. But post all that, anything you want to go from a in, from an institutional round upwards, then you need to be able to have a problem that's big enough to solve. A lot of times you end up working towards a problem which you think is a big problem, but it's it's too small for any big investor to come in and park money because that that for them is not a viable enough solution. So we work I work very actively with these founders to say that hey, let's you may think right now that this is the problem, but is there a bigger problem? So there are a lot of times when some startups, um, some founders pitching an idea to me and I see that he is right now either not wanting to reveal the larger plan because what he's trying to solve is probably a, a 1 million user base kind of a space, whereas the actual magic happens at 100 million user base, right? So there is so much more in the thing. So keeping, uh, so founder market fit is where I enter. Then we identify a product market fit. And then we say, is that a problem? Is that the right problem to be solving? Is there something else to be solved? But are you in the right space? So it's largely, that's that's how I would advise these guys when I work with them. So I, because I come in very, very early, it helps. Uh, it, it, because early stage, uh, and I also don't, don't just come in with pure play capital, right? So I do enter from a strategic investor point of view, where I do have a point of view on this, uh, where I can... I literally work closely with the founder saying, okay, let's identify a space. Let's work towards it. I'll give you an example. Um, there's one company called Desiwood, which I've invested in. They, what they were doing is uh, they do speakers. Um, so I, I don't know if you've seen Marshall. They're trying to be a speaker company, but uh, this, this is a wooden speaker that they built, which is entirely customizable. Now, the pitch to me that came from them was, hey, we build our own Bluetooth speakers with wood, which is eco-friendly. It's, I mean, the market for that isn't big enough. So I, I had to literally probe them into multiple uh, different meetings to understand saying, are you looking at this at a scale or not? Till we finally turned around and said that how they were disrupting the space of speakers where by making speakers not a one-time buy but a fmcg product which is you could buy you could buy a speaker it's almost like how you lease a car you take a speaker it's it's customized to you basis whatever you are listening to today so the design's customized six months later you can just come give it back pick up a different version for a small fee so it's almost like your speaker is always on so that that now generated a far higher demand. Now, when I look at it from that lens, now you have scale. Now you have pieces that you can get into. So it's, are you solving a small problem? Are you solving a big enough problem? That that became a bigger question to answer. So that's largely where this conversation goes with them. I like that. And, and really, investors all look for scaling. And in your case, you're not just looking for scaling. You're looking for, which is very similar to, problem solving, but are they solving a big enough problem that then can scale into a larger entity and it's worth investing in, or does it become a mom and pops me and uh, you have a potential of being bought, but is it really big enough for venture capitals to jump in? Exactly. Yeah, that's, some, that's some great advice. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that that's uh, a good way to approach it. And of course, if you're getting in there earlier, you're helping them not get stuck in a the SME start of things, but being able to work their way through and get to larger rounds on their way up. Yeah. Which, which again, I, I guess will allow me to come back again to the branding side. Uh, in that scale up side of things, do you then see that that brand can pivot as well, just as the, br the product will pivot, as you pivot the product to get to funding, will you, brand, will you have the brand pivot as well and start to brand bigger too? Is that all part of that same process? 
the story of the brand will keep evolving with the product right so it's uh, for lack of a better word it's it's the gateway drug that you launch when you come in right and then you you're now taking that forward and you're scaling it now if i look at uh from a brand perspective if i were to put this out think okay here's a story you're telling about the niche product that you've launched that talks to a certain market you understood product market fit you've got the right kind of people now you're going to keep expanding now as you expand you need to your the difference between your first million and your next 5 million and your next 10 million you your your the brand narrative needs to be wider and wider and wider so you, you have to keep adapting to that so even the brand story will have to keep changing as per how your product evolves in terms of where, what it's talking to or what's talking about i like it that's very cool so now let's jump into your the newest company that you're working on and the product that you're building there um how have you guys approached the market taking all this new amazing learning that you have from raising selling working in a space you've never been in before how much of that did you bring into this new company and can you say that you wish w- what you learned in the past you would have learned on other things way beforehand or has it just been good timing and now it's really helping for what you're building um i are, are you talking about chatterbox are you talking about my le- latest my newest uh investment uh chatterbox chatterbox okay So Chatterbox actually came out from a problem that we faced in 2014, where the influencer space was just growing, and somehow somebody decided to define an influencer from a lens of saying it's anybody with X number of followers and above. So that was a very bad definition of an influencer, in our opinion. So we looked at it and said, why is it? Why is a person being termed an influencer based on his followers? whereas and not by the influence a person has in a category so everybody is an influencer i am you are i for example from a food point of view if i was to talk to my friends and tell them of a great restaurant they will take my word for it and they will definitely go there so i am a great influencer in food i don't have a million followers with me but that still makes me a somebody who converts so i said so chatterbox is born from this particular problem it's i'm saying can we now use technology and data to identify people and we're a country of a billion in india so can you scan all of these profiles that are there and identify who is influential in what and and kind of democratize this um it it came in what it did was if there were uh, 1% of the people making all the money in influencer marketing in 2015 suddenly that the influencer economy grew out of proportion here so suddenly i may only have 1000 followers but in my class in my school in my college i would be the most influential person in tech so i would still be able to make money out of the phone uh, by different electronics and tech companies trying to get in touch so it's opened up a whole new creator influencer economy and that's what we did with chatterbox and it's kind of built in so when i drew out my thesis of influence uh, of um, investments later so which is why i have, i don't know if you uh, read that I, at at some point mentioned saying that i want to keep a consumer at the center of it and my thesis lies right from there it stems from there saying any company that helps you make a new consumer which is basically make help consumers make wealth out of it that's that's the place that i want to operate in any company that will help this consumer that have who's made this wealth uh kind of spend his money that's another space i want to operate in and the third space that i generally invest into is anything that delights a consumer so consumer is always at the center of it so now now chatterbox sat exactly in that first realm it, it was helping identify new customers and helping them make money out of their influence that they had so that's uh um, took a lot of learnings from what we've done in the past built put that into this as well uh, so glitch taught me what the larger problem statement was because we were as as an agency trying to find influencers we are not able to find the right ones so this one was coming to, in to help it uh i was obviously because of a tech led product we needed to raise some money so we ended up doing a small little raise uh, with the angel investors around 
uh, that that gave me a lot of understanding of okay how what is it that people are looking for what is how do you what kind of a valuation can you put to a table what are the other instruments i can come so every everything that i've done in the realm of investments has been a learning here so all these learnings was applied to chatterbox chatterbox again over time has evolved into multiple pieces the different things within chatterbox uh, which are but they're all branded under a uh, single umbrella called chatterbox awesome so it sounds like you learned a lot and then implemented those learnings as you continue to grow you built a brand up you solved a bigger problem and that bigger problem continues to grow and you continue to solve it but it's scalable and that's the key to all of these uh investment investors to want to come into the brand and into the business so you're a better second founder than you were a first founder and you'll be even better as a third founder because all this learning and now coming in from an investment side you're going to be even stronger and better because you've got even more tools to bring into this uh into this mix i would really hope so <laughs> Ah that's awesome. No that's good and some very good learning there too. Um well we're going to kind of shift a little bit but so one of the questions I have is that in all of the before we get to rapid fire questions in in all of the experience you've had in in the last 10 12 years of this when you shape it down you've come across lots of different startups they've told you many different stories is there one story that really kind of stands out that really blew you away uh, of this amazing feat of entrepreneurship where the startup just totally changed the way you look at entrepreneurship they they went in they did this little change and then they turned it into a skyrocket ship or something whatever you want to call it but a real good um showing of what a what an a, an entrepreneur goes through to be a startup i always like sharing these great stories that um other investors come across and they're blown away by what what a startup's done well um uh... I don't know if there is a there is a big story like that in my portfolio, but I'll definitely talk about something that I had seen at one point and I passed on it. Uh, so somebody was trying to disrupt the content space of saying written content, and he said like, "Hey, let me put things in. Uh, can AI help you write content for the future and things like that?" So, but the way he but it was initially positioned i looked at it and said it's it's one more of the service industry thing i didn't see scale but when i look at it them today it's called pepper content and they've they've kind of really scaled and they've taken they they've actually got so today when you hear a lot of startups right so they, these keywords are put in so that investors get interested in them. machine learning ai here they actually did use ai largely to do this uh but that's it i keep meeting a lot of founders and uh then us and i i call it i call it ideas that make you nervous so i recently met somebody who's who wants to start a sneakers as an investment vehicle so it's he was and it's not stockx that he's building but it's a complete it's almost like he's trying to build a mutual fund uh as we call it or something of that sort with sneakers so it's you can invest x amount of money say say if a sneaker costs 5000 these are all these high end yep. exclusive limited edition sneakers so right? it's like sneakers cost 4000 5000 you can invest 100 dollars if you have and own a part of that sneaker so it's technically he's he's opened a micro fund for sneakers now so it's a young 21 year old who's telling me this story and i hear him out and i say i a i don't understand the sneaker market the way he's talking i don't understand who spends 5000 dollars on sneakers and but there is an audience for that right so it's not a space that i understand etc but the way he spoke to me about it the way he explained this to me and the way he had his plans and his his uh, feet on the ground i looked at it and said like, for me this is an idea that makes me supremely nervous but i don't think i'm parking money in the idea i'll park on the founder so i'll I will cut him a check, and I will say, "Hey, you can." I I will watch from the sidelines because there's nothing that I can do here. That you you seem to have a much much better clarity on this front. So there are many many such people, and that, that's the best part of. That's what I really like about what I do from a in from an investment point of view, from an early stage investment. I get to meet so many of these young, smart, absolute. 
uh, geniuses, right? And who are trying, and they they open up my perspective to solving problems. I'm looking at suddenly, I'm like, hey, I'm oh, I never thought of it this way. So it's just for me, this is a great what I when somebody asked me the other day saying, hey, so are you looking at this as a full time? I don't know at this point of time, but from a, as an early stage investor, what what I take of it is it's it's my way of keeping myself updated with life of keeping myself abreast with things and making myself relevant in this universe right so suddenly it's like uh, every conversation i have with a founder who's trying to solve a problem he's showing me a whole new perspective and it's game changing the question you asked me about saying hey have you seen a startup that's you what you thought was a small little thing but they've gone crazy with there's another startup out of India called Dunzo, and you should probably look at it. What could is what what technically was started as a WhatsApp group is today a unicorn. It's of upwards of two two or three billion dollars as a company. And what what technically was that is one guy who sat there and said, "Hey, listen, I if I need to get somebody to run an errand for me, can can an app do that? Can can an app find people to do this?" And he literally started a WhatsApp group with his friend saying that any errand you want, I will run it for you. And that's how Dunzo was born. And technically today I look at it and hear their story. I mean, they have a much deeper story than I told you, but mm-hmm. uh, there, are, there are upwards of $2 billion and in valuation. And so one of the most booming unicorns right now. So again, audacious ideas, ideas that make you nervous, but they also make you look at it from a different perspective. And that's, that's the, that's what I enjoy the most on this. I love it. And uh, the sneaker side of things, uh, it's interesting because I've seen a lot about it in, in the last little while about uh, all of these different things you can do with sneakers. A company we invested in did the same thing where they were giving you partial ownership of products. It, NFTs and stuff like that are now yeah. kind of pulling that out. Um, but what's, what's fascinating is that uh, a friend of mine that I've, known probably geez 15 years he's been collecting sneakers that whole time he probably has a whole house of sneakers i don't even know how many there are and um i always thought it was amazing i love my sneakers but he did them as a collection never wore them and just kept them in the original box the original everything um and it's pretty sick the collection but who would have known right so he was able to see this vision of you know the michael jordans and having this one pair and what it would look like and what it would be in 10 20 years from now and it was bang on right now. So the sneaker phase is not a phase. It's uh, it's a real investment vehicle. And But everything is almost becoming an investment vehicle now. So, you know, anything that you can find that can carry a short-term and long-term value. And if I keep it, um, it really does take off and, and, and have its own life. So that's pretty exciting, Those the stories you shared. So thank you. Um, all right. So you mentioned your favorite part. We're going to do rapid fire questions. You mentioned the favorite part of why you invest. And I love that answer because it is huge. The, the things you get to learn from every startup and from every founder, uh, I love that part. It, it's what drives me to wake up because I don't know the next story I'm going to hear and the cool business that's going to come out of it and the excitement of being able, the opportunity to maybe invest in them. That's always exciting, right? Um, how many companies do you invest in per year? Uh, I don't go in with a number, literally. It's, so it's, it's I kind of tend to back the founders. It's the times when I go three, four months and no, I've met, about a hundred startups and not put money into any of them. But um, if if I have to go with 2020 as a indication, I made about eight to nine odd investments in 2020. So awesome. yeah, that was that was a breaking the average. Thought. That's brilliant. Yes. I love it. Um, any verticals you like to focus on? Oh uh, well, this is what I was telling you earlier, right? So it's very consumer is at the center of whatever I do. So it's startups that help a consumer generate wealth. I'm on. Let me understand that. Startups that help consumers spend this wealth. I'm on. And startups that bring consumer joy. Another thing. The common point to all of them is they're all driven by tech at some point. Tech does lie at the center of disrupting the or, or, of disrupting the existing problem that they're trying to solve, right? And which helps you now operate at scale. So scale is definitely very, very key for me. So I don't, I wouldn't invest into something that's too small. It's 
as long as disrupting something and there is and a lot of times to disrupt a space you need to have a new vehicle in which is tech at this point of time so that's largely where it is so okay. consumer at the center and move on i love it um is there timelines for your investment from day one to the time you close with them like is it one month two weeks what what time is the time frame it usually takes i actually make my decisions very quickly so i think by my second meeting i'm more or less sure if i i'm coming in or not uh so i go from so once i give a yes then it it's what it's about a couple of weeks from there in to close the deal so uh but yeah by by the second first and second meeting i first meeting kind of gives me an idea of what they're trying to do that's when i do my reading i come back with a bunch of questions by the second meeting uh, depending on the kind of answers i get i'm more or less sure if i'm in or out awesome okay uh, any sort of due diligence that you need to see to make the investment like paperwork wise team wise anything that really has to stand out for you to now go over your second meeting and saying i'm in so uh, because a large part of my investments are very early stage uh, the due diligence on the other it's very surface level on that front uh, what i look at is how big is the problem that they're trying to solve so even if they i mean when a founder tells you what he's trying to solve a lot of times they're not telling you the entire picture right they they, they do want to get your investment for that first little check and then say okay now but is there is that problem actually worth solving is there a much much bigger problem that's something that i really so i g- genuinely do study the space i invest in like i spend a good two days reading everything that i could about the sneaker space before i committed here on that so it's i do look at projections uh, so how i i do it is once my first meeting is done i kind of ask them a bunch of questions there uh, i do ask them to share some form of projections of where they are headed to etc and my second meeting is more to understand the founder from is how rigid they are how fluid they are how stuck up they are on uh, are they willing to because some people are very headstrong who believe that this is the vision and that's where it's headed and who refuse to adapt to things and that's that's where uh, it goes out okay uh, do you lead rounds uh i tend to avoid leading a round it's it depends again on the kind of startups i'm talking to i i choose to lead or participate but i tend to avoid leading around because the leading around requires a lot of time and investment uh, investment of time from my end uh which i would rather invest that time working closely with the founders in the product space because my my expertise would rather be on that than spend the time on the then because if i'm leading around then it's finding the next set of people or forming the syndicate finding the you know that's a that that's that that takes a large long uh, chunk of time for me and that time is a luxury i can't afford at this point because i do have a active day job in advertising building brands so yeah sure i love it uh, okay do you have any preferred terms that you like to invest on if it's pref share safes none of those matter you just go with the flow uh yeah i do go with the flow i i mean so the safe equivalent in india is the ccp as a convertible note of oh, sorts uh, i i always push these guys towards a ccp as a convertible note because it's a, it's very easy the, i mean safe is so easy. Uh, i love it when i have to invest in anybody in the in the valley in, who's open to taking safe because it's i think y combinator made that very very easy for you to invest with that lens so uh yes safe definitely is a lot of times because i come in from a strategic point of view uh there is a good mix of advisory and uh, advisory capital in the regular capital that i get right so now that that then differs so it de- depends on the kind of startup i'm working with or uh, uh, depends on the kind of problem they're solving if i do have an active contribution to do there and they see the value they need me on the advisory board etc then that comes with a whole different set of shares so yeah that's but safe or ccps as we call it in india is my is what i prefer because it just it it otherwise everybody can value a company in any given direction in a early stage it's it's very easy to turn around and say every company is a 5 million dollar company you are not you it's only when you start selling a certain amount when there's some form of numbers that i can figure the valuation 
No, that makes sense. That's a good point. Um, okay. And then the, uh, the last question would be, um, do you do follow on investments and do you take board seats? Uh, so far I have not done a follow up around yet, uh, but something I've always kept open. So it's in the term sheet. I tend to do, uh, always add the, the first right of refusal clause of sort somewhere. So I do that from a board seat point of view, I do. So again, I'm not precious about board seats, right? So it's, I will be on the advisory board of a few companies in my portfolio because I genuinely will be adding value to it. Again, it, what happens is when you hold a board seat, you only hold it till an institutional investor comes in a lot of times because when they come in, they they don't need angels sitting there. So then you're more of a board observer or whatever. So Correct. if yeah. if there is a company, you want to just make sure that they're not the money that you're being put in, you want to keep a check on it, et cetera. That's when a board seat comes in. But I'm not precious about it. I generally, we discuss amongst the people and say, Hey, is, am I going to be adding value? Then I'm happy to take it. But I'm on a couple of advisory boards across the portfolio. Okay. No, that's good to know. And that's uh, that's good insight for the investor side and for the startups for us. Okay. We're going to slowly or maybe quickly shift into the more personal side of things. So we have a couple of questions. Um, we've learned a lot. So far, it's been great. Uh, question number one. What would you classify as your superpower? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I I would um, I would have said that I have the ability to f- fib my way through things, which is why my career in advertising comes in. <laughs> I as a chi- as a child, I remember I used to I used to make up stories. And I could, I could make people, I could convince people. I have really good convincing powers. So I can convince people of things that never happened till I got caught for bluffing my way through at some point. Yeah. Uh, but then, so my parents said, either you stop bluffing or you make a career out of it. So that's when <laughs> I went into advertising. But I, I have a good, I think if you ask me a superpower, I can I have a good convincing skill. So, well, it sounds like you just have a good storytelling, which is what... You can do an advertising. You got a good way to yeah. get people to get behind your brands or the brands you work for. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a good superpower to have. Everybody needs to be able to tell a story. And if you can tell a good story, that's going to help anybody get comfortable to win, right? Yep. We'll just have to change the way you tell the story so that it comes across better as you're very good at telling stories. I, I, like I said, I can convince you about anything else. And that's anything I want you to believe. <laughs> So, yeah, that, I love that's it. the super power hold. Yeah, that's very good. All right. Uh, your favorite sports team? My favorite sports team. So, this, I mean, I'm not an a- active uh, sports enthusiast. I'm, it's not, I play a lot of sports, but I don't watch as much sports. So, it's, so it's, if it depends on the kind of sport you're talking about. So, if it's tennis, it's federal. If it's cricket, it will be India. Uh, but if it's football, it's Argentina. So oh, nice. Yeah. All right. No, it's all. It's it's more of a question just to kind of understand the breadth of what you like. So you're a cricket guy. You like playing tennis. Like those are all very um, exciting sports, right? So and yeah. sports tends to be a way to bond people together for some reason. And uh, f- for me, I love football. So uh, I'm an Arsenal fan, but. I had to become an Arsenal fan because I wanted to have a team that I could say I had a team because everybody would be like, who's your team? You're like, I don't know. Well, that's <laughs> terrible. You don't have a team. You got to have a team. Yeah. So I got a team. <laughs> so there you go. Right. But that's cool. I like it. All right. This is the tough question here. Favorite movie. And what character would you play in the movie? Oh, okay. So my favorite movie is a tough one because it's, the two films that sit right next to each other. So it's Inglorious Bastards and Pulp Fiction. So it's <laughs> right there. So, okay, so Inglorious Bastards and which one? Pulp Fiction. So Pulp I'm, Fiction. A Tar- I'm a huge Tarantino buff. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, which character? Between... Which character would you play in both movies? Uh, well, Inglorious Bastards, it was, it's, uh, I would, um, Damn, how do I forget the name of the character there? It's, L.I. Roth played this guy. 
I think I'm completely blanking out on the name of the character, but Eli Roth played this guy in. Is that the bear? Uh, yeah, the bear. Yeah, the guy <laughs> with the baseball bat. That's yeah, that's, that's the, the guy I want to be. <laughs> I I actually like that movie. I've seen it so many times. I have it on the player. I just play it all the time when I'm like bored. I will play Inglorious Bastards because I love the fact of the humor, but just how they twisted the whole thing around to make it exactly more palatable for the stupid atrocities that this world creates. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. No, I mean, if you if you actually study that film, you realize the kind of genius this man is. He opens the film with "Once Upon a Time," so it's he's very clearly saying this is my fairy tale. Yep. He ends the film with. Brad Pitt staring at you as the audience and telling you this might just be my masterpiece. I mean, he 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 just did that was just magic running there. So, ah uh, yeah, yeah no I like I said I I always liked that movie so that's awesome and then Pulp Fiction I've seen it Samuel L. Jackson before, so and and which Samuel character? L. Jackson Samuel L. Jackson yeah, yeah only because he's hilarious <laughs> yeah there's uh. Just for fun, you have to look up um, Samuel L. Jackson. He does a, a mini skit. I'm sure I can find it and send it to you, but he does a mini skit for hockey, and he's okay. a, a coach. He's a hockey coach. Okay. So you have to look it up. It is seriously the funniest thing ever. Uh, it's very Actually. old. It's probably like, I'm going to say it looks like 20-year-old footage. But okay. uh, um, he, Chris Chelios is part of it, like uh, famous hockey players are in the skit. Okay. And he talks about how what they were like, this coach was amazing. Oh, I remember this guy. And they, they talk about it, but it, it is absolutely hilarious. I will so, definitely look that up. Look that one up. But, um, but that's awesome. So I, I love the movies and I don't have to, uh, most of the time I have to go and watch them and it looks like I'm just getting movie reviews. But in this case, I've actually seen both recently. So I think it's brilliant. Great. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, Okay, so Rohit, I want to say thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. I got to learn a lot, and I, hopefully the audience learned just as much as I did. Uh, but I appreciate all your time. And the way we like to kind of end things off is that we like to give you the last word. So anything you want to share to investors or to entrepreneurs, I give you the floor and you know share away. But again, thank you for all your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, JP. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed this chat. Uh, I don't think I would have enjoyed it 1.30 a.m. chat more <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, from last word, I I don't know if I have anything much to add beyond what we've spoken about, but I personally think I, I really like working with startups, like I said, um, from a point of view of learning, right? So for me, it's, it's just about meeting people. It's about... It's it's my way to stay relevant. And the more people who look at it from different perspectives, I keep an open mind to that. I see that, hey, this is a, a great way to have solved this problem, which I've never seen. So maybe tomorrow, if I want to go start my next venture, well, there are lots of learnings that I can take. But my one, I'd give a lot of people. And so when even when we started, I think that is, it's... Don't be afraid to make a mistake. And I, that's something I tell every single founder that, or every single startup that I put money in. I say that don't be afraid to make a mistake because it's only when you're making new things do you make mistakes. So as a founder, if you're trying to solve a new problem, it's fine to go into the unknown. Go, f It's okay to fail. You can come back. We can always figure a way around from there. But if you start being very... Um, risk averse and you don't make these mistakes then you're you're only aping somebody else who's doing something else so you're not making something new so if you're making something new you will make a mistake that's okay to make a mistake so you go with that flow and anybody who's willing to do that is he's got uh, my attention so that's awesome. that's my last word for this brilliant well thank you very much for that uh, thank you very good words very wise you will make mistakes learn from them and keep growing uh, yeah. Again, awesome to have you on today. And we will keep you posted on when we post this out and blast it out so we can support each other. Thank you for jumping Absolutely. on at such a late hour. And outside of that, I'm just going to pause it. But thank you for one for one for joining us.